I'm a hawk for arrangements and making sure that they develop and grow through the song, you know, but n- I never, I really try not to like one, I don't like over arranging, you know what I mean? It kind of feels like you, you almost want to work with whatever's happening and like, just let it flow naturally. Kind of like let the arrangement ride its course and just kind of get, like almost like support it versus force something to happen. <laughs> Thank you.
Nate, welcome to the podcast, man. How you doing? Good. Thanks so much, Ryan. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, yeah, my pleasure. Um, we were just talking a second ago. You are a native New Yorker, born and raised in Brooklyn? Uh, born and raised in the Upper West Side of Manhattan, actually. Yes. So don't You're in Brooklyn, Brooklyn now. Bread. I live in Brooklyn now. Yeah, I live in a neighborhood called Prospect Leopards Gardens. Okay. And, um, so not too far from, from my folks, but in between, obviously, went to Berkeley College of Music, and that's where I met the rest of the Mile 12. We started mm-hmm. up there. And then uh, stayed up there for like four years after graduating. Where where are they at geographically? Are they in New York? Are they Boston? Are they Nashville? Are they scattered? Yeah, we, so the band is still based in Boston, like meaning okay. that three out of five of the members live there. So, okay. you know, we have the majority going on there. Um, and then our, our mandolin player just recently moved to Burlington, Vermont. Okay. So all Northeastern uh, musicians still. Sure. Um, but yeah, yeah. So Boston is like definitely the home of the band, like you know, we'll do rehearsals there and like, you know, prep work and all, all sorts of video shoots, all sorts of different stuff happen there. Okay. How, how regularly, I mean, that's a bit of a commute, like what, two and a half hours. Yeah. It's, it's longer than that. It's like, uh, on a good day, it'll be like four. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> you know, it can be up to five with traffic, but, um, you know, a lot of people actually go back and forth. Um, like, you know, if you live in New York, but teach it, teach at Berkeley or NEC sure. or something like you'll be, commuting every week or whatever i go like i would say it averages out to about once a month you know throughout okay. the year. um that being said like there could be months where it's like two times or three times and then it's like we're touring elsewhere for the summer and i'm not up there at all so but right. it's, I think, generally about once a month right speaking of which you guys got uh you got some tour dates coming up in march correct Definitely. Yeah. We were about to launch our third full length record called close enough to hear. Mm-hmm. And, um, we're doing a, our, our biggest show ever in Boston at this spot called the Sinclair. Okay. Um, great standing room venue in Cambridge. Um, a lot of, you know, bigger acts in our scene have played there and, and we're just like really excited to put on a big show there. We have like two different bands on the bill, friends of ours. Um, and that kicks off the tour. And then we head down south for the end of March, wrapping back up um, actually with a New York show in mid-April. Right. I see that April 15th at Rockwood. Yeah, totally. Rockwood Stage 2, um, definitely more of the, the lively party venue. Yeah. Uh, we've, yeah. done, we've done one a bunch of times back in the day and two once. And I've played three. Okay. Are you still there? Yeah. The uh, thing got a little... Sketchy. See you. <laughs> Can you hear me? There, you're back. Boom. It just came back. Okay, cool. Uh, so you're saying you played stage it three? Be fine. I, I, I did so many gaming yesterday. Uh, you were saying you played uh, stage best, three you know, quite a bit? A great listening room. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, stage three is like a great room. Yeah. Nice. Uh, so you guys all met in Berkeley, and then how uh, the band is Mile 12, you met at Berkeley. How long, when like initially meeting each other, was it like, okay, we're going to we're gonna put a project together? Yeah, it was. It happened pretty quickly. We met at this great spot called the Cantab Lounge. Okay. And they used to have bluegrass nights every Tuesday. So it was like... The whole scene, like whether you're a Berkeley kid or you're like a local picker who like has a day job or whatever, you would come to the Cantab and everyone would be playing together. Okay. And so we met there and then, you know, saw each other around town at different house parties. And I I think we kind of decided we wanted to start something up like a few months after that. Mm, Pretty Um, quickly. Yeah. Yeah. And some of the original members, like our banjo player BB and myself were kind of on the front edge of the band and, and we actually got our front man Evan involved afterwards. Okay. I gave him a call and we're like, Hey, do you want to start a band? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he was moving back. He's actually moving back from New York to Boston. Okay. This all happened in like 2015. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and so when was the first recording out? When did you guys like, you put the band together, you put material together. When, when was the first album? Totally. Our, our first, we had an EP of six tracks that came out. I want to say early 2016, okay. I believe, or it was late 2015, a long, long time ago. Our first full length came out in 2017, um, fall 2017. And then we had a second record come out uh, spring 2019. And then this is our third with an EP in between the two. 
Okay. So, yeah. It's very cool. Lot. Yeah. Right. Uh, then you've also released some of your own music, right? You did an EP back in the day, Walking Away. Totally. Walking Away came out 2018, um, six track EP, really like everything but the kitchen sink kind of arrangement and production value, like real lush textures. I did a lot of horn arranging for it. Okay. Um, and I'm actually working on a solo bass and voice project now that um, I'll fill you in on later on when it comes out. But it's yeah, like the exact opposite, bare bones, you know? I, I did want to talk to you about that because I read about that. Um, how, what's the style of the solo bass project? Is it more on the avant garde or is it still kind of a bluegrass Americana folk feel? Yeah, it kind of like both of those things have their place within it. Like there's one, there's actually one track that's like an original fiddle tune of mine that like okay. a bass fiddle tune that I, I go free in, like I'll go free improv in the middle. Okay. So like, which is kind of a thing that happens in New York, you know, like you're blending those elements together. Sure. But uh, there's a lot of more like original songwriting. I, I say lean more towards like the pop side of things. Okay. Um, on there too. So, it, but I think it, the core of the project is it's, it's a folk project. Cause it's like, it's kind of like field recordings. It's like one person and their instrument very stripped down. Sure. But um, definitely borrowing from a lot of different genres. And I, I'm like, I've been exposed to so many genres growing up in New York and like just going to Berkeley, like, I, I feel like I, it's not true to myself if I if I kind of just pick that one kind of sound or lane. Like I, I sure. like exploring all sorts of different textures and, and sounds. So who were you? Who would you uh, cite as some main influences on this solo project? Totally. So um, Edgar Meyer is a huge one for sure. Oh yeah, I love you all know, those records. One of the best, if not the best, uh, upright bassist to grace acoustic music. Yeah. Um, really kind of, he was one who blew the doors off the, the role of the instrument in the genre and said like the bass can do so much more than what yeah. it's done historically. Right. You know? um, huge inspiration for sure. And actually the, the producer of the record is this guy named Bruce Molsky. He's a great, mm -hmm. um, mainly known as a fiddle player and a singer, but also plays guitar and banjo, but he's really well known for playing solo in our scene and he's producing the album, obviously a huge inspiration for it. This idea that like you can just take your instrument and create something of value on your own. Um, and that's like, that's not like, you know, just a singer songwriter in their guitar. Sometimes right. that's really intricate stuff and very uh, um, compelling, but sometimes it can be kind of like recycled, you know, mm -hmm. like strumming the chords, singing the, the, singing the melody. So like with the bass, it's just taken some more like um, focus to like arrange the music in a way that is compelling and be like, make sure each song has its own angle and utilizes the instrument differently. Um, so he's a big help for that and a big inspiration, you know, and um, other, other bass player, Scott LaFaro is a huge inspiration for sure. Of course. Playing super yeah. melodically up the neck, you know? Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I'm a huge Mingus fan, more as like a writer than a okay. company. I mean, I love his bass playing, but like his, his writing, big band arranging is the best. Um, yeah. Have you ever caught the Mingus Big Band before? Um, years ago, I'm from Arizona, and so when the Mingus Big Band came through Arizona years oh, ago, nice. I want to say like oh oh two or oh three. Nice. Uh, Boris was playing bass. I believe that's his name. Yeah, yeah, that sounds right. I think he's with Manhattan Transfer now. I think. Okay, nice. Yeah, I'm actually not familiar with where he's at, but I definitely know the name. Yeah. So he was um, playing with them. Uh, yeah, the band was on fire. It was great. Yeah, I just saw them like there was their first show after the pandemic at uh -huh. in the East Village here in the city. And it's like, it's my, I think it was my favorite show I've seen in the city thus far. It really? Was, yeah, they're magnificent. I mean, they, they're yeah. on the music so well. And I just love the spirit of the music. You know, it's like, it's the opposite of like conservatory jazz, you know? Right, 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 <laughs> right, right, right. Absolutely. Uh <coughs> Where do those, where does um, that, that music, uh, Mingus's band with big arrangements, uh, rowdy arrangements, yeah. uh, you know, very blues based, very spiritual based. Uh, how do you, what characteristics do you identify with that music and bluegrass or the music you're putting together for your solo project? Yeah, that's a really cool question. Um, I'd say like all, all American music stems from the blues, you know? Mm -hmm. To, to some extent, you know, African-American spirituals and, and slave music and all that kind of stuff. So like drawing from that, like bluegrass is drawn from that in a, in a deep way. 
a lot of people think of it as like white music, but like there's half the half the music is like comes from there, and half comes from like Scots Irish fiddling and and storytelling. Mm-hmm. So like, I think there's a huge connection with like. I've heard Lucas referred to as like white man soul music or something. You know, <laughs> it's, interesting. Um, this, it's like there's just a lot of properties that are very similar and a lot of crossover sure. repertoire too. Mm-hmm. You know, not so much with like you know jazz or what Mingus was doing, but like you know older spirituals, um, right? You know, getting carried over like Will the Circle Be Unbroken and stuff like that. And uh, yeah, as far as my solo projects, I, I definitely have a couple songs that like lean more towards like the soul side of things. Um, but like, you know, try to do it in my own way, but definitely, um, just, I don't know, it's just all the tied into the American fabric and the American sure. ethos, you know? Yeah. I mean, I've, I've always kind of thought, and, uh, please straighten me out if the, the idea about this is not accurate. I've always kind of thought like back in the early, you know, early 1900s, maybe even mid 1800s. Maybe even way back before that. I don't know when the time frame would be, but it all did come from spirituals because it came from the blues. It just came from two different racial perspectives of the blues. Mm, yeah. And I, and and I don't want to say racial perspective of the blues because white people that didn't come from white people, you know, that uh, from all my kind of research on blues music and American culture and uh, within that, um, that's not. That's not white people music <laughs> that didn't come from us. Oh, no. uh, it came from the African American culture, and but it's it did come. There's a there's an element of this folk nature, and how that came through each aspect of their church, whether it's kind of an Appalachian thing, like you were mentioning with the Scots and the Irish, and how that was related to their spiritual endeavors, uh, and then the the African Americans from you know work songs you know, during enslavery, being enslaved, and then through the church and all that. I think it all kind of got routed through the church at some point, just with quite a big racial divide at some point. Yeah, so true. I mean, you look at, there's a first-generation band called the Stanley Brothers, Okay. Huge inspiration for most bluegrass musicians. And, like, they all a lot of their music was coming right from their church, you know, mm. and, and the way they sang hymns and yeah, the idea that there would even be, like, harmony singing in bluegrass, like, a lot of that stemmed from the church. Okay. Um, so it's very interesting. Yeah, it's it, it definitely like ties in, and it's funny being like a Jewish kid from the Upper West Side. Not really, not really either either yeah, corners right. of the of the church sure. world, you know. But um, I, I was like, I think it's funny. Like there are a lot of Jewish bluegrass musicians and folk musicians, obviously with the folk revival in the '60s and everything. Mm-hmm. So like, there's something about there's, there's something like socialist about the the or like egalitarian maybe about the genre. Okay. The way that there's professionals playing with hobbyists and like everyone has a chance to take their solo and speak their mind. Like, I think there's something there that ties into like a, the more like lefty Jewish political thing. Interesting. Uh, Days of Yore. Yeah. There's definitely something there, you know, because there's so many of us that have been drawn to this culture and this music that um, there, there must be a link Hmm. in my mind. Hmm. Well, that's fascinating. Is there uh what would kind of folkloric uh Israeli music be like? I don't know if I've heard it, so I can't really put a finger yeah. on it. And what might the characteristics of crossover be there? Or the relationship from that to Celtic music? Yeah, I don't I don't I, I don't know much about like Israeli folk music, to be honest. Um yeah. I mean I know I know like a little bit about like the I've heard like some pop music before that like harkens to folk music. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, I I don't know the history that much. Huh. But as far as like Celtic music goes, that stuff's probably more directly influenced American music, you know, just because of who came over. Sure. Um, you know. Um, but yeah, yeah, I, I don't play. I actually, don't play like a lot of like people. You know, my label like Jewish music. I don't play a lot of klezmer music mm-hmm. or like Israeli folk songs or anything like that. Um, but I, I do have a song like about my family coming to the U S that okay. the band recorded on our last project. Um, but it doesn't like really sound or like, it doesn't really have anything to do with like Jewish folk music, but sure. the story is kind of of those people at least, you know, my, yeah. my ancestors. What, uh, what generation in the States are you? Yeah. Um, I am 
fourth generation slash third. Like some of my great grandparents were born in Eastern Europe. Some were born okay. here. Okay. But my grandparents like grew up, you know, hearing Yiddish and speaking a little Yiddish around the house. Yeah. And then, but then, you know, that hasn't really stuck around except for a couple words, <laughs> um, you know. But, do you, uh, yeah, do you yeah. go back? Do you go back? Uh, have you been to Israel? I, I, no, I, I, or to Israel, I went once. Yes. I was a long time ago. I was 18. So I wasn't really focused on like, you know, uh, the deeper meaning or. Sure. I, mean, the, I took a class on Israeli-Palestinian relations to try to get a more like even perspective on what was going on. Mm-hmm. You know, um, so that was interesting, but I was really just like the drinking age was eighteen. I was like, sweet, you know, <laughs> game idea. on, game <laughs> on. <laughs> but I haven't been to like where my family was from, really, which is like my dad's family is from um, near Minsk, like which I think is modern day Ukraine, and okay. then Russia as well. So that that area of the world is isn't really safe to go visit right now. But right, at that point, you know. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, I'm embarrassed to admit I haven't, I don't really know what's going on over there anymore. It's, it's, I know it's still not great, uh, obviously, but I don't know the the nature of the war or anything. Uh, have you been following it because there's some connection to it? Do you? No, I mean, yeah, I I don't feel like I'm so removed from there, right? Fourth generation you know, a way that I don't, I don't really follow it. Like, I don't know anyone over there, mm-hmm. but, you know, just as any uh, person might check it out. That's kind of how I've been. Right. Right. Like yeah. it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot to digest. Uh, exactly, that's man. What I, yeah. Um, cool. So let's, let's go back to music. Uh, you got <laughs> quite, you got quite a few records, uh, not only with the band, uh, mile 12, but you got some things out in different genres. Um, mm-hmm. you do some arranging, you do some arranging. What, um, has arranging been a passion of yours kind of from the get go? Or is that something you discovered later on in your musical career? Good question, man. I, I feel like I've always been pretty into it. Mm-hmm. Like a good arrangement can, can do so much for a song, you know? I agree. Yeah. 100%. Um, and like, whether it's with like a bluegrass band instrumentation, like we have mile 12, or like more rock band with a horn section, like walking away or the solo bass and voice thing. Like I am, I'm a hawk for arrangements and making sure that like they develop and grow through the song, you know, but n- I never, I really try not to like one, I don't like over arranging, you know what I mean? It kind of feels like you, you almost want to work with whatever's happening and like, just let it flow naturally. Mm-hmm. Kind of like let the arrangement ride its course. Sure. Just kind of get, like almost like support it versus force something to happen. Right. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. But I, I, I feel like it's super important and I, I've been into it for a long time. Nice. Uh, have you, have you written for big, big groups, like big orchestras or big, I've done some arranging, ensembles? Yeah. I, I worked with the Heifetz Music Institute, Yasha okay. Heifetz, you know, the, the violinist and, did um a, a large orchestral arrangement for some folk songs actually Shenandoah mm. and um yeah I, there was one other one there too but Shenandoah is the one that I'm remembering now um another great you know a just American song that can kind of exist in so many different ways mm-hmm. um and I did some more small ensemble arranging too string quartet violin and piano um and then all the horn arrangements on walking away um as far as notated arrangements that's kind of what I've done but then like all the, all the arranging for the band is done kind of democratically. We'll be in a room together and toss ideas around. Sure. You know, I'm, I tend to be kind of a loud voice in the room when it comes to <laughs> I have a lot of opinions, you know? Yeah. And our, our thing is like, we try every idea, right? Okay. You got to try it before you nix it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It. That, that's a good I, policy. It's a good yeah, policy. A good idea in, in speaking terms can turn out to be bad and vice versa. Sure. So you execute it and then you decide what, what works. Right. Do you guys like have a voting process? Like, do you keep it really democratic? It's pretty like, it's pretty, once you hear it, you know, you know, we have, I think the thing with us is we've always, the musicians in the group have always had very comparable taste. Okay. You know, like that's important. Kind of wants the same thing or relates to the genre in the same way. Like we're all kind of like nerdy conservatory kids. Right. You know, playing music that isn't historically academic. 
you know, so we have, uh, there's a certain flavor of the music that we all kind of exist in. And this kind of like scene that came out of Boston that now has spread, you know, mm-hmm. over the last couple of decades. So, um, yeah, we, we both, we mostly agree when we hear something, whether it works or not. Yeah. Uh, that's an interesting, uh, idea that you bring up is like, yeah, being educated, academic, going through those channels within music education and then getting into uh, a genre that is typically thought to be just kind of very uneducated and and not academic. It's pretty much, you just, you know, get a guitar, pick it up and start going, you know, you sing along and it's, it's very, uh, you know, you don't need to study it. Um, So how did you go about learning bluegrass? Did you learn it in an academic did you learn it from records? Did you learn it in class? Did you learn it just playing like kind of, you know, on the hang, so to speak? Right. Or did you? A mixture of all of it, man. Yeah. Okay. Like, so Berkeley has a great American roots music program, you know, mm-hmm. that focuses on bluegrass, old Appalachian old time music, which is separate um, Delta blues even. And then some Celtic music is, you know, it's offshoots like the music that it came from. Um, and um so that was kind of, you know, something that would happen in the classroom. Like I, I took a lecture class on like the history of American roots music. I played in the bluegrass ensemble at school, but then mm-hmm. I was also outside of school, like going to this place, the can't have lounge and picking learning tunes. And like, yeah, I think that that second part of it, like just being out and playing like and learning on the sure. gigs is more the way I actually learned the music and the style mm-hmm. and, the, and the vocabulary and all that. Um, being in school gave me like a nice foundation for it, I would say. And, like um, some context for it, but it's like you can't learn how to play music in a classroom. Right. Really. Or like not, you can, I guess, but you can't like learn why you would play music in a classroom. Like, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You kind of have to learn that for yourself, right? Like being out there and doing it and your reasons personally for like why, why are you trying to say what you're g- trying to say, you know, like that, that doesn't happen like sitting at a desk. So um, I hope that like as the as American roots music continues to like infiltrate uh, conservatories around the country, which I think it will and is. I've been hearing time, that. Yeah, different, I mean, schools uh, are trying to diversify, right? Like what they're sure. offering. Um, I just hope that like we can maintain the spirit of it. It's an oral tradition, right? You're learning. There's not a lot of written music for this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Like so, th- that should be maintained. You know, you when you learn a fiddle tune. You have someone who knows it, they play it, you play it back. No one's writing yeah. it down. Right, you know? right. Um, or that's not the main way to learn the music. Sure. So I hope that that, you know, like I just want to make sure that, you know, as this music gets disseminated, like you want people to understand how to teach it and what it's about. Like that's the integral spirit of the music. You can't lose that. So, how did you, how yeah. did you get interested in bluegrass coming from, Brooklyn and growing up in in New York where there's a very diverse, you know, people and and music and you're exposed to a lot. How did you find bluegrass or bluegrass find you? Yeah. Like, yeah, my whole childhood was very much like not folk music. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Like, or for the, you know, for the most part, that's kind of what people would expect. Like I started singing choral music in middle school. Mm -hmm. There's a great choir called People's Chorus in New York City. Okay. um, That have, have done some amazing things. So then that was, yeah, that was a whole mixture of stuff. We would do some older music, but primarily it's like showcases new composers. You know, we did like a Terry yeah. Riley piece one year. Um, the women's chorus did um, Every Stop on the F Train. I'm blanking on the name of the composer. I, mean, I think it's a Meredith Monk composition, actually. Let's look so it like, up. Every yeah, Stop on the F Train. It's, it's rad. It's literally Every Stop on the F Train in New York, just like sung. Um so it was a lot of that kind of yeah, New York avant-garde new music thing. Um, and then I started, I went to LaGuardia High School, which is an arts high yeah. school here in the city. Yeah. Um, and for voice, you know, so I was singing classical rap, more choral okay. music there. Picked up the bass, started playing in a rock band, writing my own songs, uh, and then went to Berkeley for, for upright bass. So I've had like, you know, official education with voice and with bass. Um. And, and yeah, as far as the folk music thing, like, I think I got into it through the more avant-garde side. Like, are you familiar hmm. with Chris Dealey, mandolin player? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, he's done some stuff with Brad Meldow. Like that's a yeah, good yeah. One yeah, and, uh, I'm blanking yeah. on the band right now. Nickel Creek, uh, Punch Brothers. I'm probably thinking of. Uh, well, who's the band like years ago, early 2000s? Oh, was that, yeah, that was Nickel Creek. Uh, I was a real, huge fan of them. Band. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I forgot they they came up in conversation on the podcast not that long ago. I can't remember why, but um, oh, cool. yeah, I'm a big we fan. That dude can play. Like that... Jeff Picker, maybe or something. <coughs> I don't think so. No, I don't even know okay. who that is. Yeah, uh, I'd like to. He's a solo thing, and he's playing okay. with him this year, so I don't know. Nice. Um, yeah, yeah, but um, his new newer project, Punch Brothers, had been around since like late um, aughts, you know, 2008 mm-hmm. or so. And like they're they're like pushing the boundaries of what a band collectively will do in the genre, you know, or right. instruments. Like a lot of people don't even call them a bluegrass band. Like their their instrumentation is identical to like the older bands, and that's one thing in the genre that's super important. It's like there are these certain instruments you play in it, mm-hmm. you know, but there's no rules about how you play those instruments necessarily. Okay, you know? I always that's, kind of thought everybody kind of had a role them. within it, like. I always thought banjo might be a wild card, but you're always going to have <laughs> mandolin, acoustic, upright, and a fiddle player. Like, those to me are the staples, yeah. and banjo is the, eh, maybe. Right. I feel like yeah. Nickel Creek doesn't have a banjo player, for instance. Um, but, yeah, there's there's traditional roles for each of those instruments in the genre. But at the same time, like, they they have been consistently pushed mm-hmm. from the beginning. Like, don't let anyone ever tell you that it was like some sort of fixed science at the very beginning. Like, Bill <laughs> right, 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 right. there was just as much exploration and like creativity um, happening in bluegrass as there was in jazz from the mm-hmm. beginning. Okay. As far as like how you approach the instruments and the, how virtuosic you could be on a certain instrument, you know, um, the original, the, the famous banjo player who you know popularized the style, Earl Scruggs, mm-hmm. was. Like to this day, he's still considered the best banjo player, uh, best three finger banjo player of all time. Okay, you know, by many, by many, and yeah, Bela Fleck maybe gives him a run for his money. You Bela's know? ridiculous. I've seen Bela's him live ridiculous. several times. Like, yeah. Even Bela has tells this story. He got pulled over at a traffic stop in Nashville where he lives, and the cops like he looks at his ID and he's like, "Who's the best banjo player of all time?" <laughs> Bela says, "Earl Scruggs, of course." And it turns out it was like Earl Scruggs' grandson or something. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, he even knows what's up, you know? Yeah, right. So, but the genre has been constantly evolving through through the, the last, like, you know, better part of the last century. Mm-hmm. So Punch Brothers doing what they do is, is really just a continuation of what happened in the 70s and the 80s. There's records like Strength in Numbers um, that came out, like really progressive stuff for the time in the 80s. Sure. So... That all said, like it's it, the the genre kind of respects musicians who play the instruments of the of their forefathers, right, so, right. But in a way that is more modern, or like, yeah, like they do a version of Radiohead Kid A, for example. Okay, okay, you know, and that's just like so unheard of on those instruments. But they like they utilize the instruments in a way to like create those sounds and those textures from the record. You know, yeah. so our band is trying to, you know, mile 12 is trying to do that in our own way. Like we're not, you know, we're not the punch brothers, obviously, but we're, we're really into singer songwriters and like into the craft of songwriting. It's probably mm-hmm. our primary like focus as a band. So it's really just the arrangements are like, how do we, how do we arrange to serve the song? Sure. You know, um, sure. which isn't always the way that arrangements work in the mm-hmm. genre. And like, but for us, that's, that's our, RMO. Okay. Um, are there who's kind of the the driving force as a lyricist in the band? Is that also collective? Not so much. Like our our frontman Evan Murphy is guitarist and singer. Frontman mm-hmm. generally, you know, like he doesn't front every song, but um, he writes the like majority of the songs. Okay. So a lot of those songs, you know, and I write some stuff, and our fiddle player Ella Jordan also is writing now. Um, we we all bring songs to the table that are kind of fully formed, you know. Oh wow! Okay. But, yeah, but that being said, like, there's so much work that needs to you know happen. From like, if you have music and lyrics, um, you still even have to decide like chords. What chords right. are we going to use? Well, who's playing when? Like, you know, all the arranging stuff happens collectively. Sure. 
Um, but the music and lyrics are are written by a cert, uh, by one person. We don't do a lot of co-writing in the band. Okay. Okay. So everybody's got just, they'll bring in the tune, pretty much put together. And then you guys just work out how you're going to present it. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Yeah. And that, and that can take some time, you know. Yeah. It took the better part of a week to like arrange all the music for the record for close enough to hear. A week? That's, that's yeah, not bad. Yeah, yeah. That's actually really quick. <laughs> did, did, yeah i mean does that did that feel like a long time for the band it, uh, it did because we spent we were like it was like doing like six hour days every day you know oh wow so I think that's a lot of like, hours put in yeah that's what i mean it's like because we don't live in the same city so we all had to like get together right and make it happen so you know it might be yeah it might be quick for some but for us it felt like a lot of a big workload mm -hmm. you know what was the recording process like yeah, so we cut in um, this great studio called Great North Sound mm -hmm. in Parsons Field, Maine. Okay. Um, real out in the woods kind of place. Like you're, you know, you're holed up there all week and retreat oh, style cool. recording process. Yeah. That's very cool. So, and we recorded um, mostly isolation. Uh, the, the rhythm section was in the same room, like mandolin, guitar, and bass. Mm -hmm. we, were all, we all tracked in the same room along with lead vocals. Banjo oh, wow. and were isolated. Uh, and then we went back and overdubbed harmony vocals after the fact with some overdubbing of solos as well, you know? Um, but yeah, and the process was great. I mean, we don't, the record is very like, we're not using any like after the fact effects or, right. you know, or, or, you know, the production value is very like, as you would hear it live, which is Correct. very common of like folk music and acoustic music, you know? Yeah. Um, so we are like, just doing that thing. And, um, yeah, it was, it was cool. It was a great process. I mean, we, another like kind of big thing we did it all at once, which is also a lot of work, you know, yeah. over the course of seven days, we self produced, okay. which was a lot. We, in the past we had producers, but we decided this one would be self produced. Which one do you per, uh, personally prefer? Do you like relinquishing control and letting somebody else mm. kind of, you know, throw in some ideas or give feedback or do you guys like, you know, do a take. No, not the one. Do a take. Yeah, I think that might be it. Let's go listen to it. Talk yeah. through it. Which one do you prefer? I I, I prefer having a producer, like an extra mm -hmm. set of ears, sure. after not having one now. It's too much work for the band to self-produce the record. Yeah. I would say. Um, that being said, like, I like having input as an artist. You know, like, I don't want a producer just to just control everything. Right. And the producers we've worked with in the past have been, have been more like musically uh team player you know okay. like they're not like taking the reins so much like they'll offer feedback or they'll like let us sit in the room while they comp takes and we like work together you know yeah it's been great but i i imagine there's some producers out there who are like this is my side of the, the job like right, right. Or, let me do my thing you know so i wouldn't love that so much but definitely someone just to take the load off and if you need to take a break like you can take a break right Right. Yeah, it's a lot to, I think, mentally and uh, emotionally navigate wearing, wearing all the hats. You know, like, I would prefer showing up and just playing, you know, and then, yeah. like, another set of ears that I trust just to give me, you know, that knows what I'm going for if it were a personal project. You'd be like, yeah, no, that's that's not another one. I think you guys have another one in you. Do it again, right. you know. Okay, great. Definitely. You know. It's just like, yeah, let someone else guide you, you know, a little bit more. and Yeah. I mean, the solo project, like, there's no way I would not have a producer for this. Like, mm -hmm. and Bruce Molsky is like the best person I could think of to produce it because he's done so much solo recording himself. Right. Now, um, so it's like, for me, like, play a take, play a couple takes or whatever. I should be able to, like, go outside and go for a walk or get some fresh air while there's still work being done, right? Right, right, Without a producer, you have to sit there with the engineer, which is what we, one of us had to be there at all times for the mile 12 session, which worked. You know, like, we're doing fiddle overdubs and, and comping. Okay, Ellis sits in the room. Harmony is like, I'll be there. Evan will be there. Like, Banjo, BB's there. Like, right. But it's, it just, it's a lot of, like, I think what did, what did Sam, our engineer, Sam Kassir, said, like, it's like we're, like, an amoeba. Like, <laughs> you know, like stretching and like pulling at each other, but generally moving in the same direction. Right. You know, that's kind of what it felt like that week. How was, um, would you guys like lay down the bulk of it and then like get everything laid down and then go back for overdubs? Like this is overdub day. This is vocal harmony day. 
Or would you see one song from start to finish and then move on to the next song? Kind of like a mix. I'd say it's, we went, we went like day by day for the most part. Like if we're tracking two or three songs in a day, we'll get the, like, we'll do like four or five takes, comp the bass take together Mm -hmm. and maybe do another thing just like that. Second one around. But then the end of the day is like, um, you know, comping solos or overdubbing solos, fills, harmony vocals on that song. We didn't want to wear ourselves out on the harmony vocal thing, you know, like knocking out like seven different songs of harmony vocals in the same day. Is <laughs> right, right. That's, idea. Yeah, that's taxing. For your voice, you know, yes. Yeah. So we, like we had a plan and we've, we've all been in the studio enough to kind of know the best um, practices, at least for our group. Mm-hmm. So it's not like we were like at a loss of how to structure it, you know? Yeah. It was just like, whoa, this is a mountain of work here, you know, <laughs> yeah. we're realizing. And like, I'm, I'm glad we did this the way we did, uh-huh. you know, had the experience and like, you know, just to see how it worked, but I wouldn't do it again. Okay. Yeah. I wouldn't do it again like this. Uh, speaking of producers, you've produced, talk about the album I've you've produced. produced. Yeah. yeah. Man. So um, this is like a pandemic project. Um, fall 2020, um, I went into the studio with a singer songwriter in Boston named uh, Mark Abruzzo, mm-hmm. you know, from Abruzzo, Italy. Um, not he's not Italian, but his family is, you know, historically. That name from- that name is not Italian. No, uh, he. I meant to say he's an Italian American. Like he's not Italian. Okay, Italian. He, I, okay. So he's, yeah, he doesn't live in Italy. Abruzzo, exactly. Yeah, okay. He doesn't live in Italy, but he's okay. from like. Um, I was gonna say that last sure. name doesn't sound any more Italian than like that's as Italian as you get. As Italian as it gets, yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's right. super, super Italian in some way. Um, but he um, he was a bass student of mine before the pandemic when I was living in Boston. Okay. And he reached out to me maybe like six months before we went into the studio in fall 2020. He's like, hey, I have some songs. Can you give me some feedback? Started like that. So I would just be like listening to his songs and like maybe I would demo a couple with like full instrumentation i don't play drums but i'll like slap some midi drums on there you know okay electric bass lead guitar some harmony vocals maybe change so the form around is it kind of like a pop rock thing or is it a country thing what's the it's like a, it's like a singer songwriter record okay it's kind of like mile 12 a singer songwriter record with acoustic instruments you know okay um there's with, with the vocal there. harmonies yeah definitely a lot of vocal harmonies you know and um some tracks lent, lean more like bluegrass or more like straight ahead um, than others, I would mm-hmm. say. But uh, it's like acoustic music, you know. I mean, that's kind of my my mo at this point. But um, so I was helping with that, and eventually we were just like, "Hey, let's." He was like, "Hey, like I want to do a record. Like, would you be up for producing it?" Mm. You know. And I was kind of like, "Well, I don't have anything else going on." Yeah, 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 yeah. I have the time. As right. long as everyone tests beforehand, like I'm game. Cool. So I, I got a band, you know, like he, he had the budget for it. I hired, hired the musicians I wanted to hire. Um, I'll live in the Northeast and okay. we went into a studio like about an hour west of Boston. To okay. Track. Um, I should say like a couple tracks actually have drums on there, you know, okay. like, so really some of it does lean more towards like Tom Petty kind of vibes. Mm. Okay. You know, um, no electric guitars or anything. So it's kind of like, I, I, as a producer, I wanted to like, what's the center of the record? You know, like the center is like, um, upright bass, guitar, mandolin, and fiddle. Okay. Kind of Still that. using folk instrumentation as the nucleus. Exactly. But like yeah. banjo kind of, you know, you add a banjo and it, it draws it into that bluegrass. Quickly. Banjo is yeah. like the um, character instrument of the, of the band. Right. You know, <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. It adds all that spice and that kind of like pop that you'd imagine in a bluegrass dance. Like without it, it kind of the four instruments with lack of banjo can kind of function. I think in a more like um, genreless realm. You know, yeah. it's just kind of like generic folk band mm. you know, kind of sound. Banjo brings it into the bluegrass. So like I had banjo on some tracks, and then on other tracks I had drums, which went more okay. to pop. And then I ditched the mandolin for those tracks, you know, so like right. folk rock, like folk Americana singer, songwriter, bluegrass. Where okay. Neat. It's like, I didn't want to expand a lot more than that. Yeah. As a producer. I didn't want to, I don't want to add electric guitar to that. You know, it, it feels too removed from the center of the album. Sure. <laughs> that was my thinking. And it was great to produce, man. I'd never like done it before. How um, much, um, how much experience had you had? I think the term producer can get, and maybe talk about your experience with it. Actually, definitely talk about your experience. Um, 
sometimes it's on like just a person in the room calling the shots. Other time it's very linked to the audio engineer of a session too, who's making decisions and production will be part of what gear to use, what mic to use for what sound Mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, Where did for you on this record, where did the audio engineering aspect of it, how much of that was a part of it? Totally. Great question for sure. Like I'm definitely more of like a player producer, like a musical producer. Um, mm-hmm. I played bass on the record too. So I was like involved in playing takes. Yeah. You know? And I would like, it was, it, the ears were interesting. It's like, I had to play bass, but like really what I was listening for was like the full take. Sure. You know, like I produced your ears on, but like was physically tracking bass. Um, as far as like what mics use and whatnot, like I'm, I'm not proficient in any way on like yeah. gear and like names. I, I, I'm not that, I'm not that guy either. Right. right. So like the engineer really took the lead on that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm more like, put that mic on it. Let me hear it. I'll give you feedback, you know, like in a musical sense, Sure. I can, I can, you know, I'll be able to hear anything as far as like EQ and you know, the way a mic, you know, interprets a voice or an instrument be like, Oh, that's a little thin compared to this, et cetera. But right. I never be like, let's try this mic. Cause I know, I'm a nerd on that stuff and I'll, you know, it'll work. I I'm, I'm, that's not really my guy or my type of expertise. Sure. So I was definitely the player musical producer kind of role. Um, and, and it worked pretty well, man. Like I, I, I didn't mind playing and producing like the music for me was like right up my wheelhouse. I didn't have to like, it wasn't yeah. like a, a jump for me to like play. Right. right. So I was like, if it was some heady stuff, you know, like five, eight, like B, D, yeah. D flat, like <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not producing. I mean, I'm, yeah. that. I'm just going to like, I got a shed beforehand and Kevin prepared and just play. But this was like, sure. this is what I do for a living, you know? So right. it, it felt good. Nice. Uh, what do you got coming up after the mile 12 tour? Yeah. Um, so mile 12 close enough to hear release tour is, is mostly March. Actually mm-hmm. before that, I'm going out on the road with this great new duo called the foreign landers. Foreign uh, Landers? Foreign Landers, yeah. Okay. One is from South Carolina, one's from Northern Ireland. So they, okay. there's a song called Foreign Lander that's like uh, well known in the genre. Okay. Kind of playing off that. Um, so we're going on the road in the South in February. Okay. Starting at the world famous Station Inn, if you heard of the Station Inn in Nashville. I haven't, no. Okay, Nashville. Yeah, it's like, uh, it's like the Village Vanguard of Nashville. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. It's like the country music venue with like all this history, you know, like nice, um, great spot. So we're playing. There. Have you so, you know, played there before? Yeah, I've done like, done like three or four shows at Station Inn now. Um, nice. Uh, well, I never played there with that with a different group, so this will be new for me. Okay. Um, I'm starting there, but we're working our way east, North Carolina, Baltimore, West Virginia. Um, so I'm kind of like I'm doing some road stuff with them this year, with Miles Twelve this year making this new solo record. Um, so it, it's kind of the, the pandemic feels, I want to say fully in the background, but like, I definitely feel like, you know, touring is back and yeah. Um, I'm excited for that. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. How did you link up with uh, the folks from foreign Islander, foreign oh, Islander? Landers? Yeah. Foreign Landers. So it, it's actually the, um, on the mandolin player that used to play mile 12, um, got married to his, okay you know, partner, musical partner, Tabitha, and decided to start their own project. I see. So he was like, oh, let's call Nate. Like, I played in the band with him for like three or four years. Like, may as okay. well get him on board, you know? So is it just the three-piece then? It's uh, the four, actually, with a fiddle player as well. So Okay. Yeah, and they play like, David's known for playing mandolin, and <clears throat> Tabitha's known for playing banjo, but they're both also quite proficient guitar players. Okay. They'll, they'll toss in a guitar on some tracks, and... David has, I don't know how familiar you are with all the different types of mandolins, but there's like octave mandolin, like the, you know, it's tuned the same way, but an octave lower. There's mandolas, which I believe are tuned like viola tuning. So like there's yeah. all these different, and they kind of, they kind of create like a warmer sound than your typical mandolin, like more guitar-like, mm-hmm. you know, so he's using that a little bit to fill in the texture. Um, but yeah, instrumentation wise, it, it's more variable than like mile 12, which will be interesting for me. You know? Nice. Um, because it's a base podcast, you got to be a, a geek and t- talk about nerd uh, stuff, nerd well, stuff. I can nerd out about. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what strings do upright players or bluegrass players use? Like, I know, obviously, what the jazz guys are focused on in string selection. Right. But what 
what what do you guys look for? You because you're looking for some thump, but not too much sustain, right? Well, it depends, man. Like I'd say, there's two schools of thought with okay. it, and two 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 sounds that are popular. Mm-hmm. One is like what you would describe, like the historical tone uh, for for a bluegrass upright bass player is like you're on a K bass, you're on American standard bass, you know, sure. kind of a retro sound. A lot of them are manufactured in like the 40s and 50s. Yeah, and you got gut strings on there. Okay. Or synthetic gut, right? So it's, right. And that, I know, like historically in jazz, that 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 was a sound too. That kind of like thumpy, tubby tone. Yeah. Like uh, that's that, just what there was. I mean, for for right. the instrument, that's just what there was. Right. You know? Yeah. Steel strings weren't around yeah. yet. Totally. Yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, that that kind of sound has continued on for bluegrass players. Some people really mm-hmm. into that. Um, they're not very bowable. Like you can't arco right arco right. very well on there and. But they're really slappable. You know, there's just mm-hmm. super low tension and like you you can keep them like super high off the fingerboard and just like yeah. do all that kind of slap bass, rockabilly stuff. And there's some slap bass in bluegrass, but like more limited. Okay. Um, but then there's this whole other school which I kind of participate more in, which is like steel strings um that are kind of more flexible, like hybrids. You okay. know, and I, I use fire core, domestic fire cores, which are known for being pit strings. Yeah. You know, but I play with a bow and they're nice and bright, so they kind of have this fiddly kind of tone. I feel like under the bow. Okay, you know, it's a cutting sound under the bow in a way that you don't get with orchestral strings so often. Right. Um, well, yeah, I mean they're, they're a little, uh, yeah, they're a little bit more scratchy than an orchestral string for sure. Exactly, but like that yeah. kind of works, you know, for what okay. I'm after. And I, I tend to, I, I think of myself as like a fifty-fifty pits and arco player. Okay. Um, Do you really, be pretty that's, active? That's, pretty active regularly with the bow yeah yeah um i would say on the on a mile 12 show i'm like i'm not actually 50 50 as far as what i'm playing i'd say it's more like yeah. an 80 20 or 75 25 yeah um you know but i'm definitely or maybe even less it might be more like 85 15 you mm-hmm. know but uh, that's a lot for a bluegrass band or a bluegrass yeah. bass player you know playing arco did you study um, a lot of that repertoire uh, at berkeley or after you're just yeah, your own I mean, practicing. I didn't study a lot of classical rep, but I studied with a great teacher named Susan Hagen. Okay. She's, she's on faculty at Berkeley, and um, yeah, yeah, I, I know the name. I uh, subs in with the Boston Pops and whatnot. I think or yeah. she might be in the Pops full time. But um, so I did some bow work with her, um, and and played in a string orchestra at school called Berkeley World Strings too. Okay. Uh, I actually just got the first my first opportunity to play Carnegie Hall in July. Oh, that's huge! Like one classical gig of the year. That's um, that's the place to do it. Like if exactly. you're doing one, would, you know, a year in a lifetime, Carnegie's the I spot. Was, I was honored to be a part of it. It was the conductor from the ensemble at Berkeley was contacting okay. for for a new piece that we were performing. So I got the call for that. Um, so like, yeah, I like my reading shops are you know you always need to dust them off. Mm, yeah, <laughs> not doing it that much, but um, I've done it enough and sung enough choral music to where like it's pretty ingrained. I just have to like brush up. Sure, um, you know. So yeah, um, I've done a mixture of all sorts of things, but really at, at the core of who I am, I think I am a, a folk musician, and okay, that's why I feel so comfortable like in a bluegrass band or playing alone. It just kind of feels like the right. Right, right fit for me. Yeah. What's uh, what are some ways that you would like to personally kind of some things you'd be interested in pushing the folk uh, genre in some directions that you're kind of interested in pushing that in. This mile 12 record close enough to hear is like, it's it's probably the proudest I feel about music I've made. Oh, awesome. That's cool. You know, um, the music is like, is kind of bullseye for what I feel like our band is trying to say for like all these years. Okay. You know, like, um, where like it, it's tied into like the history uh, and the context of bluegrass and acoustic music, mm-hmm. but it's, it's really like about the songs yeah. being performed. Like the, the fact that we're a bluegrass band and the fact that we, you know, play how we play is like, again, serving the song, right? It's not about the record. Isn't about how well, how well we play or how well we sing. Right. Hopefully both of those things are there, you know, but like, yeah. I feel like when you focus on the songwriting, there's this three dimensional three dimensionality that happens with the music. Like it feels like deeper. If that makes sense. Like if, if music can be either 2d or 3d and the meter of that is like how well a song is crafted, I, mm-hmm. I want to go that direction, you know? Sure. Um, I don't know how to describe it other than that, you know, but sometimes it's like, there can be a record with like great players. 
Yeah, I think we've all kind of heard those records where, like, on paper, it should be a slamming record. And then you listen to it, it's like, eh. Everybody can play, but it feels disconnected and, you know, maybe the material is a little flat or something. And it's it's a little bit too individualistic and there's no real kind of glue that's holding it together. You still Sorry. there? Yeah, I'm oh, okay. good, man. It just froze for a second. I don't know. All right. Got we've it. Now we're back. Until then, so. Yeah, we're cool. Um, but yeah, so Mile 12... We're a songwriting band, which is not yes. the most common thing in the genre. And I feel like we've accomplished something with this record um, that we've all been wanting to accomplish since this started. That's great. That's great. Yeah. The name of the record is Close Enough to Hear? Close Enough to Hear, coming out hey. February 3rd, a week from today, my friend. A week from today. Cool. What do you, where's the CD release show or the album release show? Yeah, the, the big show is at the Sinclair in Boston, Massachusetts. Okay. It's March 2nd, Thursday night. Um, we'll be on the West Coast in June, though, so definitely keep a look. You know, if anyone's out there, we're nice. in uh, Grass Valley, California, which is near Sacramento. Where's... Okay, and we'll might, we might make it down to your neck of the woods. Maybe we'll do an LA show. Yeah, let, me know. let me know. Definitely, let me know. That'd be great. Um, yeah, man, we're, we're San excited Francisco. To, like, have this out. I feel like San Francisco would be a good spot for this type of music. I feel there's like there's a lot of history over... of bluegrass music in San Francisco. David Grisman quintet, and there's some crossover sure. there with like jazz. You know, yeah. If you're familiar with him, uh, um, yeah. I was actually just spoke with his son. Uh, oh, Sam. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, when was that? Was a week and a half ago. And and Jim Kerwin has been on the podcast. Who played with uh, Grisman and Garcia? Nice. That's awesome. Yeah. Man. yeah it's like. That's kind of the the epicenter of that style, you know, mm-hmm. of acoustic music. It all happened on the West Coast, right? Um, pretty sweet. So definitely a history, and um, we've been out there a good amount. So cool. Yeah, we're looking forward to bringing it around and just sharing with people. Fantastic, man, Nate. This has been a pleasure, dude. Keep me posted on when the solo record comes out. Sure I definitely want to uh, have you back on talking about it. And I definitely want to hear it myself. Oh, dude, I'll, I'll hop back on for sure. All right, killing, dude. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, we'll let's stay in touch. Yeah, definitely, Ryan. That'd be great. And thanks for having me on. And um, yeah, I look forward to uh, to everyone hearing the new Mile Twelve record. Yeah, yeah. Uh, February third. February third. Yeah, Tomorrow. that's it. Uh, cool. Now we'll I'll end it there. Um, should I get in touch with the PR company to? I'll just need a picture, a bio picture. Oh, um, what? how about you just give me your email and I'll shoot it over. Okay. Just yeah, for, sure. You want you want a full band thing or just me? What uh, uh, if you have something of you playing the bass, that'd be great. Totally. Um, or whatever, because it'll have the picture and the name, and if no one's familiar with the band, they won't know who Nate is if they see all all right. of the band, you know. So maybe use just better. Yeah, is it cool if I have some press photos that I like? Like I'm holding the bass, not necessarily playing. Perfect. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Whatever you like, and however you yeah. want to represent yourself. Perfect. Uh, I got some nice press photos uh, hopping around. I can send you. Okay. Uh, yeah, my email is just Ryan at the shed dot com. Cool. How long have you guys been around? Uh, I've been doing this 2018, I think. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's nice. it's a one man show. It's quite a bit of work. Oh my god, I can imagine. Yeah, and there's a whole um, website with like transcriptions and yeah, uh, it's still finding itself a little bit. I right. turned it into a nonprofit, so they're like putting together classes to go into schools and oh, nice, wow, face education. It's a whole thing. I got my own record coming that. out. Yeah, I'm maxed out. <laughs> Dude, that's great. Great to hear that you're like doing yeah. education outreach. And I have like a patreon page and stuff too i should have plugged that but it's all good oh well, i will on the i will on the front i saw it on your website okay cool um, yeah yeah the it's it's funny because uh, talking to so many people on the podcast to do teaching and the the nonprofit is kind of uh it's like a base school but completely online so mm-hmm. you can study cool. with dudes in new york uh like you know, you could teach a master class on bluegrass or the history of folk music and everybody could chime in and, you Absolutely, know. Man. I should, I would love to do that, like, in tandem with the solo record release, mm-hmm. you know. Um, I, I want to get in touch with, like, Better Bass Lesson or, like, Discover Bass and Better Bass Lesson okay. on YouTube, those guys, too. Like, yeah, the teaching thing to me is, like, super important and, like, I want to tie it into the, the performing. Oh, killing. Yeah, man, uh, let me know about it because uh, I don't really know. I know... Th- I've checked out a little bit of Discover Double Bass. Uh, I yeah, was like trying to get that dude on the podcast. I forgot his name. Oh, yeah. Uh, I haven't even, like, really chatted with him or the... the he um, wasn't that interested. 
yeah. but <laughs> I, I feel like I, I got this thing like he thought there was some kind of base competition between us, which is not the case Your because I've reached on YouTube. Like, what is he talking? Yeah, and I'm, dude, the, 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 my whole thing about all of it is like let's just grow the base community. So I've reached out to like. Yeah, you know, I was writing for Base Magazine for a little bit and reached out to those guys and like, let's, you know, if if one of us comes up, then we all come up because like this this yeah. whole part of the world is so small. Like, yeah. there's a lot of bass players, but it's such a niche thing. Yeah, within... people don't people don't think of us very much, you know. No, like, no. You know, so like every band that exists has a bass player, but like, right? No one knows their name, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And so I mean, I've been interested in that and like linking people and companies together, and it's interesting the amount of people that aren't. Uh, they say they're interested, but they will put time into connecting is, is fascinating. Right. Yeah. It's kind of sad, but yeah, yeah. Uh, educationally, let's definitely, uh, let me know when the record comes out and let's talk about doing something like that. For sure, uh, man. Yeah. My, my goal is like early next year. Okay. I'm um, head of the studio in June, so... 